Okay, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here today and to talk to you about um, neuroendocrine tumor management using various kinds of what we call systemic treatments. These are treatments that uh, involve treating the body as opposed to treatments that treat only one particular organ, like a liver, for example. Um, I, in the question period, I'd be happy to also answer questions about how different kinds of treatments are combined and how we uh, choose particular kinds of treatments and any other types of questions like that that you might have. The first thing I'd like to do is give you some basic perspectives on use of chemotherapy and biologic agents in treating neuroendocrine cancers, and then we'll talk about some specifics, some new directions in research, and some very exciting uh, things that are on the horizon. First of all, chemotherapy using normal types of chemotherapy drugs does not usually cause a major reduction in tumor size in neuroendocrine tumors, and in general is not something that we think about using um, in carcinoid tumors. The one exception might be in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors or in tumors that are more high grade, those are more responsive. Despite the low response rate to various kinds of drugs, response meaning shrinkage of the cancer, these drugs can often prevent cancer from growing, can markedly prolong life, and do have a major impact on length and quality of life. Targeted biologic therapies for neuroendocrine tumors are really where it's at today. These kind of drugs have made a major impact, in many cases a much bigger impact than the older types of chemotherapy that are still being used for other kinds of malignancy. The unique chemical makeup of neuroendocrine cells makes them particularly ideal for being targeted by biologic agents. Neuroendocrine tumors, as we heard from Dr. Fisher, have increased uh, amounts of blood flow and increased amounts of substances that stimulate blood vessel growth and anti-angiogenic drugs that target these make very good therapies. They have increased growth factor receptors and various kinds of so-called tyrosine kinase drugs can be used to target those. Genes involving maintaining the malignant state are overactive in neuroendocrine tumors, and those can be targeted, and new drugs for targeting these are being discovered all the time. Neuroendocrine tumors have lost their dependence on external stimuli to grow and generate internal signals. These can be attacked by treatments, and they are, there are multiple biologic properties, as you can see, of these cancer cells that can all be attacked. So rather than using chemotherapy and trying to kill cancer cells faster than injuring other cells, it's uh, now possible to use many kinds of therapies that work on specific targets within the neuroendocrine cells and can often control the cancers with very tolerable or minimal toxicity. Now, molecular profiling, again, we heard a little bit about from Dr. Fisher, helps identify potential markers and substances within the cancer that can be used to target uh, specific therapies. There was a study done not specifically in neuroendocrine cancer, but in cancers in general by Dr. Dan Van Hoff. Molecular targets were found in 98% of tumors when um, people looked hard enough to find them. And when therapies were directed by molecular targets, 27% of patients seemed to have a longer progression-free survival when it was used. The problem is in neuroendocrine cancer, we're still trying to find more treatments to work on these particular targets and to find targets that are going to be the most valuable. Tumor specimens removed at surgery are sent for molecular profiling. In the case of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, there are several driver mutations that have been discovered. One of them, mTOR, has led to many important uh, clinical treatments, and we'll be talking a lot about those. So the era of molecular profiling and targeted personalized medicine is here, but it's here in its infancy, and we have to watch it grow and develop. There's some major problems with molecular profiling, not only the outrageous cost that uh, can be associated with it, but it's very difficult when you use assays that are, have not been validated yet and we're not sure how to interpret the results. You may end up selecting a treatment that's in inappropriate for a patient. You may have to screen large numbers of patients to find a rare patient who can benefit from a particular treatment. And most importantly, the molecular target is continuously changing because mutations happen in cancers as they grow. 
So you may think that you have a molecular target based on an initial biopsy, and then five years later when you have a metastasis, you may have different molecular targets that you wouldn't even know if you didn't have a new biopsy. And there's some major uh, ethical questions and uh, cause questions about doing invasive procedures like getting biopsies over and over to try to find a treatment that is unproven and we don't know how well it's going to work. So we really have to see how this evolves, but I think it's going to be the wave of the future. Okay, somatostatin analogs. We saw some beautiful slides of um, what a neuroendocrine cell looks like with the five different somatostatin receptors on the surface. Somatostatin being a natural hormone made by the body as the turnoff of the endocrine system. It turns off hormone production, it turns off cell growth, it turns off endocrine cells. However, natural human somatostatin, which you see on the left, is a hormone that lasts only two or three minutes before it's completely gone. You eat a candy bar, your blood sugar goes up. The body makes insulin, the blood sugar goes down. If you don't stop the insulin, the blood sugar will go all the way down to zero and you'll be on the floor having a, a seizure unconscious. So before that happens, the body then makes somatostatin, shuts off the insulin, the blood sugar stays at 70 instead of at zero and everybody's happy. So this is a negative feedback, it's a turnoff. But it's being used now to turn off the growth of neuroendocrine cells and it's really quite good for that. It's not a very practical therapy though when a drug only lasts for a couple of minutes. So instead of using natural somatostatin, we use what is called somatostatin analogs. They're slight changes from the original molecule that confer stability and let the drug last for a long time. So the most common one, the one that's on the market now, is octreotide, goes by the brand name of sandostatin. Octreotide, you can see, has the same active part that binds to the somatostatin receptor. What you see in purple is what actually sticks to the cell, to the somatostatin receptors on the cell surface. But by modifying things just a little bit, slightly shorter uh, size molecules and uh, modification in one amino acid in the binding site, it all of a sudden binds for a long time and various forms of octreotide can last as long as one injection every four weeks, octreotide LAR. So this has made a major impact in its ability to be a therapy. Now, a clinical trial that has really been important in proving to the world the importance of octreotide as a cancer therapy was done in Germany, known as the PROMID trial. The name PROMID coming from the letters that you see in red on the top to make this ridiculous uh, acronym. <laughs> okay? In any case, it's known as the PROMID trial. PROMID trial was a randomized trial between octreotide LAR, 30 milligrams, standard dose, given in the rear one time every four weeks, in half of the patients, the other half of the patients got a placebo. And what happened? What happened is remarkable. In those people who had a relatively low volume of cancer in the liver, people who may have had previous surgery or embolization or other cytoreductive, we call procedures, reducing cancer in the liver prior to this, or people who just started with less, the octreotide treated group went for 27 months on the average before anything grew. TTP means time to progression. So time to progression, 27 months. People who got placebo was about seven months. So this is a huge increase in the period of time the cancer was controlled without any of the toxicities associated with um, stronger types of cancer treatment and uh, maintenance of quality of life and control of cancer. So this is really an important drug it's an anti-cancer drug that works more powerfully than many kinds of chemotherapy. In fact, for carcinoid tumors, it's stronger than most kinds of chemotherapy in controlling cancer. In people that have a high volume of cancer in the liver, as you can see in the curve on the right, the time to progression is 10 months instead of 27 months. Still double what it would be if you didn't use octreotide. It still has a benefit, but the benefit is not as dramatic. Okay, so on the basis of this, octreotide LAR is being considered a standard of care in patients with newly diagnosed uh, whether cancer, whether it's active or inactive, whether the octreotide scan is positive or whether the octreotide scan is negative did not seem to make a difference in this particular study. And these tumors were mid-gut carcinoids with low hepatic burden having the very best results, but really 
and everybody. It had a benefit. Okay? And we don't know the total survival benefit, but I could tell you that as you saw in the uh, slide about the prevalence of carcinoid tumors, as soon as we had octreotide around for treatment, people started living an awful lot longer, and it does seem to be making a, a major difference along with the other therapies that we have for neuroendocrine cancer. Okay? Now, this is a problem with octreotide. This slide comes from my nurse, Face and Angel, represents an octreotide shot with a great big needle stuck in somebody's rear. Not a pleasant thing to have to do every month. So there is now an effort to improve upon the situation, and hopefully the day will come when people won't have to look like this poor gentleman on the rocks. <laughs> There's a, an oral sandostatin, which is uh, a, an oral form of octreotide, which has been um, recently developed in Israel, and uh, clinical trials are just uh, about to begin. I think that that's something that we have to keep in mind. It's not going to be ready for prime time for a while, but it's in the horizon. And lanreotide has come along as another very exciting thing, because lanreotide is a subcutaneous injection one time every four weeks. Instead of an intramuscular injection, it can be done with a smaller needle, and it's less painful. It's also particularly good in people that are very thin and don't have a large rear for putting big needles into. And it's good for people that are particularly obese because the needle may end up in some fat instead of in muscle, and you have very poor um, maintenance of therapeutic blood levels if you do that, and sometimes the drug doesn't work as well. So for the, the fat and the thin, it's particularly ideal, and I think that we really have to keep an eye on this. We've had a lot of experience using lanreotide on clinical trials in carcinoid tumors uh, with carcinoid syndrome and carcinoid tumors without carcinoid syndrome. The data is still being analyzed, and I would hope that before too long this drug is going to be submitted for approval to the FDA, but it's right now not generally available except on clinical trial unless you have a, uh, a lot of luck with your insurance company because it's usually not paid for. Now, paziriotide is another somatostatin analog that we've had a lot of experience in. Uh, Cedars-Sinai is one of the uh, major places, in, certainly in the, in the world, using this particular kind of somatostatin analog. This is a really unique somatostatin analog because, do you remember, there were five kinds of somatostatin receptors on those neuroendocrine cells. Octreotide binds to type 2 receptor to really one of those five kinds. But, but paziriotide binds to four out of the five kinds of receptor, binds with much higher binding affinity, and can be very helpful in controlling carcinoid syndrome or other hormone secretion syndromes, or even cancer growth in certain patients that cannot be controlled with octreotide. Studies are still ongoing, but we've been very excited by the data, and we have multiple paziriotide trials currently underway. So stay tuned. The use of mTOR inhibitors, mTOR being a very interesting enzyme inside of cells that's a central regulatory enzyme in cells that controls assimilation of nutrients, that controls how fast the cells can grow, how fast they divide, how long they live before they undergo uh, biologic um, re sort of uh, dissolution and death, uh, apoptosis. This is all regulated by the central enzyme. An extraordinary story about mTOR inhibitor medications discovered when somebody was visiting the Easter Islands to look at the giant heads on the big island called Rapa Nui in Polynesia. They have huge heads that weigh maybe 120 tons and nobody knows how these things got built out of stone. You know, more than a thousand years ago when people didn't have uh, modern engineering techniques, okay? Brought some dirt home from R R Rapa Nui Island to see if there might be a fungus growing there that would be kind of unique since it's such a unique um, ecological env environment there and see if there was an antibiotic that nobody found in China, America, Africa, or anywhere else. And sure enough, there was an antibiotic that was never found anywhere else. And they named it Rapamycin after Rapa Nui. They had no idea what enzyme it was working on, but 
doctors like to make things sound really scientific sometimes, even when they don't know what they're talking about. So they called the enzyme that it works on mTOR. mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. So now you have a drug called <laughs> a, a, a mTOR inhibitor, and you have an enzyme called mTOR. So what does the mTOR inhibitor do? It inhibits mTOR. So you kind of go in circles. Well, this went for a long time until people realized that not only was this an antifungal antibiotic, but it was also a really potent anti-cancer drug for certain cancers that had uh, mutations in the um, signaling pathways associated with this enzyme. So a lot of research has been done. We now know that rapamycin works on a particular uh, part of this enzyme complex called mTORC1, but there's also mTORC2 and there's PI3 kinase and AKT and it's a whole, lots and lots of research done on this. But it all comes from that. Rapamycin has a generic name of serolimus. Serolimus. That was the first mTOR inhibitor. There is an analog of serolimus, which is very, very close to the original, known as everolimus. Everolimus is a user-friendly pill that you can take once a day, and it's being used widely now in treating certain cancers. So this is how we ended up with everolimus. <laughs> okay? Talk about serendipity. Okay, so a randomized trial of everolimus versus placebo in carcinoid tumors, largest uh, randomized prospective trial in carcinoid tumors ever to see what would happen. However, I have to emphasize it was not really everolimus versus placebo. It was everolimus plus octreotide versus placebo plus octreotide. We already saw that octreotide is an anti-cancer drug. So there really is no placebo group. The people not getting everolimus and octreotide were still getting octreotide. Okay. When the trial was finally analyzed, the um, results were felt to be not statistically significant because of sort of a little mathematical quirk. So the trial was called a negative trial even though there was a 5.1 month prolongation of medium progression free survival in the people that, that got Everolimus. And some people on the, that same Everolimus trial are still cancer, um, cancer has not grown and cancer is remaining under control five years after they were started. So it definitely is an important anti-cancer drug. Clinically, it seems to be quite an important anti-cancer drug, but because of this um, officially negative trial, it was not able to be submitted to the FDA for approval, and it's not approved. Just to put everything in perspective that I'm talking about today, the FDA has never approved any drug in the history of the United States for treating any neuroendocrine tumor whatsoever, except ones that start in the pancreas. So carcinoid tumors have no approved drug. Every single thing that I'm telling you today is about unapproved drugs, unapproved uses, and clinical investigative trials. It's kind of shocking, but it's true. In the case of pancreas, we have everolimus, sunitinib, and streptozosin. That's in one particular subtype of, of neuroendocrine cancer. So this is where we stand. And the Radiant 4 trial is now underway. Radiant 4 is a randomized trial. Two people get everolimus. The third person gets a placebo but the patients are being monitored very, very closely, and these patients do not have carcinoid syndrome. They're being followed closely so that everybody who was on this trial will um, not have anything um, bad happen, even if they were randomized to receive the placebo up front, but it will clearly see what the difference is between this drug and placebo. The FDA has insisted on this mechanism in order to have the drug approved. So the faster this trial is finished, the faster the drug will hopefully um, be on the market, or the faster it will be submitted for approval. This is the last stage of clinical trial before approval, so-called phase three, okay? Now in the case of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we'll say a few special things about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors because they are a little bit special. First of all, they're quite rare. There are three cases per million out of this whole group, the, the carcinoid tumors that start in the small intestine being more common, still rare. 
and they're felt to be more aggressive than other forms of neuroendocrine cancer. They are uniquely responsive to chemotherapy if the right chemotherapy drugs are used. There's a combination of streptozosin, doxorubicin, also known as adriamycin, and 5-FU in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. 39% of patients had a major shrinkage of cancer with modern measurement techniques using this. The median time it lasted was 9.3 months. You can see that the control period is no longer than it is with plain old octreotide, even with the best chemotherapy, but the difference is that this in the case of pancreatic tumors can result in a shrink of cancer. It's not such a good thing for carcinoid tumors though. Same goes for the other combination that I'm showing you here of temozolomide and capecitabine, also known by the brand names of Temidor and Zolota. A high response rate, 71% of patients having what was called a partial response with a major shrinkage of cancer. But again, the period of time that it lasts is uh, limited. There's a large clinical trial that is about to begin comparing temozolomide alone versus temozolomide plus capecitabine, a very, very important trial that's going to be done by the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, and we'll uh, be able to have access to that as well. And I think that that will hopefully settle the issue on exactly where this fits in the armamentarium. Again, this is for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. A study that was done in parallel with the one that I showed you for carcinoid tumors called Radian 2 is Radian 3. This is a randomized trial that compares Everolimus versus placebo in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, the largest randomized trial in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors ever done. This is a cancer with an incidence of three per million, and you can see there's 207 people got Everolimus and 203 in the placebo group. However, anybody who wanted in either group was able to have um, octreotide in addition. This study, very, very strongly positive. Everolimus, the average amount of time the cancer was controlled. PFS meaning progression-free survival. That means how long you can be without any cancer growing. 11.4 months with Everolimus, 5.4 months with placebo. You can see that despite the mathematical manipulations, the amount of prolongation of progression-free survival of cancer control is roughly the same in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and in carcinoid tumors with this drug, but it is only in pancreatic tumors that the statistics came out in such a way that it was able to be submitted and approved. So it's now on the market and is available for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors a 2.4-fold increase in median progression-free survival. At 18 months after starting, 34% of people getting Everolimus had still not had any progression versus 9% of placebo patients. The reason that some people with placebo may be able to go for a long time with control is also because of the fact that um, octreotide was allowed in addition. Okay, there's now a next generation mTOR inhibitor, which is, we're hoping, is going to be even more effective and uh, better than Everolimus, known as BEZ-235. Remember, Everolimus inhibits the mTORC1 enzyme on that signaling pathway that controls all of these important cellular functions. BEZ-235 inhibits that same enzyme as Everolimus, but also inhibits mTORC2 and PI3 kinase, so it, it does a much more e extensive job in shutting down that particular uh, signaling pathway that uh, stimulates growth. So to answer the question about whether it's uh, really better, how much better, and um, how um, important it is in improving uh, the quality of life of people, there's a randomized trial going on between BEZ-235 and Everolimus, and this is a study we have open right now, and um, it's, a, I think, an important trial in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and one that can really make a difference. There's also a next-generation mTOR inhibitor that we're studying in carcinoid tumors known as CC223. CC223 is also an inhibitor of mTORC1 and mTORC2, which is uh, more than the, just the mTORC1 inhibition we see with Everolimus, 
we're seeing some very exciting uh, information coming from the study in carcinoid tumors that will be presented at the American Society of Clinical Oncology in the next couple of months. But I think stay tuned, and that trial is ongoing uh, right now. It's about, it's uh, just in, in the process of uh, reopening after allowing more patients to be included. There's another one called BKM120. That's another inhibitor of this pathway. And again, it may turn out to be an important trial coming up. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors, another major class. Sunitinib is a drug which has been used in treating pancreatic neuroendocrine cancer. A trial of sunitinib versus placebo. It's a pill taken once a day. Very similar in some respects to everolimus. It's not in, not in terms of its chemical actions, but in terms of the fact that it's an oral drug, it's a biologic drug. The results are almost superimposable. Progression-free survival with sunitinib, 11.4 months versus 5.5 months in people taking placebo. If the dose is monitored properly, most people tolerate it well. It can lower blood counts, raise blood pressure, and some people can have um, skin rash, diarrhea, and other things that are usually well tolerated and, and um, make it a reasonable treatment to use in uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Anti-angiogenic drugs, I previously mentioned, and so did Dr. Fisher. Bevacizumab, which goes by the brand name of Avastin, is a monoclonal antibody to the um, vascular endothelial growth factor receptor. It um, is a, a very well-tolerated drug in most people. Everything in the world has possible side effects. It can cause sometimes serious bleeding or, or clotting or problems with wound healing or intestinal perforations if right after intestinal surgery. But if it's used appropriately, it's a drug that can have an important action. It looks like from an early study, a 24% response rate. Most importantly, there was a very large randomized prospective trial that we were very active in comparing bevacizumab plus octreotide versus interferon alpha, an immune stimulant versus plus octreotide. That's been close to accrual. The results are being analyzed, and we'll have results of this shortly. But if this proves the effectiveness of Avastin, this may become a drug commonly available, a drug which is a little bit difficult to get a hold of if you're not on a clinical trial because of the enormous expense of the medication if you're just um, writing a prescription for it. Another drug I wanted to tell you about that's in development is LX1032, also known as Tristat, which is something that stops serotonin production. It's an oral medication, and by reducing serotonin production, you can stop diarrhea from carcinoid syndrome. This is in a phase three trial, which hopefully will um, be um, proven to be effective, and we'll have this drug uh, before too long for general use. It's still in clinical trial right now, and I just wanted to be sure that you hear about that. This is a picture of uh, some new types of scans, which are still uh, coming um, of age in America. This is the same patient imaged on three kinds of scans. The top one is a, is a CAT scan, not done with any special technique, but just a normal CAT scan where you can miss an awful lot of things. And you can see it just looks like there's some tumor in the right side of the liver, that very top picture, those dark areas re represent um, tumor right around here. Okay. The one here in the middle is an octreotide scan, dark spots representing liver metastases on a liver that's already a little dark, hard to see exactly what's going on. On the bottom picture, we have what's called a gallium-68 dotatoc PET scan which is another way of using octreotides, uh, but bound to a different isotope than the one indium-111 you use for the octreotide scan. And this will show lots of little tumors that you may not even be aware that you had. It's not a scan that needs to be done all the time. Compared to an MRI scan, which we use routinely, an MRI with Eovis shows things that are just as tiny as what you can see on this scan, but it doesn't have any radiation at all. This has some radiation because of the fact it's both a PET scan and a CAT scan, but for certain purposes, it's ideal. And if you, for example, were thinking about having a liver transplant, or, and if you had any disease outside the liver, you wouldn't do it, I couldn't even imagine submitting to a procedure like that without having a really high-quality gallium-68 dotatoc PET to um, 
make sure that there's no disease outside the liver. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is what I think is one of the most exciting developments that's come along in a really long time in neuroendocrine um, cancer treatment, and that's the use of what goes by the nickname of PRRT. PRRT stands for Peptide Receptor Radiotherapy. Sort of an awkward name, but it refers to using a somatostatin analog, typically something that is like octreotide, which sticks to the receptors on neuroendocrine cells. You do this test only on a popul this treatment only on a population of people who have a positive octreotide scan. The octreotide scan proves that you have somatostatin receptors because if you don't have a positive octreotide scan unless the octreotide is sticking to the cancer cells and shooting out the rays from the NDM-111. So when you have a positive octreotide scan, you could then substitute the radi radioactive material that is attached to the octreotide. Instead of having it be NDM-111, we use another kind of radiation called lutetium-177. And in other uh, trials in uh, Europe, people have also used yttrium-90, and there, there's some other things that could be used, but the, the most um, appropriate one at this point seems to be lutetium-177. When you would use lutetium-177, 90% of all the radiation that comes out of lutetium-177 is electrons. They're called beta particles, and they only travel for two millimeters, roughly a sixteenth of an inch, and they're completely gone. So you could inject this material IV, the radioactively labeled octreotide with lutetium-177. You inject it as an intravenous infusion, just as a normal IV. It goes in the body, sticks to all the tumors. Everything not stuck to the tumor is eliminated in the urine. It's just peed out within a few hours. And the lutetium-177 will then shoot out these rays that can only travel about a sixteenth of an inch. So the tumor and a little tiny rim around it get very, very high doses of radiation, and the rest of the body gets practically none, and it's remarkably safe. There's only 10% of the radiation is a gamma emission, which is the, what you have in a bone scan or an octreotide scan, but it's done so that in America we can do this easily as an outpatient, and it's very well tolerated by most people, although everything can have some serious side effects, and I'm happy to talk about all of that sort of thing, about toxicities and how we prevent them. But just the concept is really remarkable. It's given as one treatment every two months, and it's given four times. So you do four times, stop, and in Europe, the experience has been that for about 40 months, with this kind of a treatment, when they analyzed the first 504 patients, progression-free survival was 40 months. In only less than 20% of patients was there any cancer progression. And in everybody, it would either stop the cancer from growing or shrink to some degree. Most people did not have a huge, huge shrink, but some people do. It was found that if kidney function is really bad, that the treatment is dangerous because you have to eliminate the unused radiation in the urine. What's not treating the cancer needs to be eliminated in the urine. So you need to have a blood creatinine level less than 1.8. It was also found that you could infuse intravenous amino acids. And if you do that, it protects the kidney by speeding the elimination of the drug in the urine along with the amino acids. It's, there are very rare people have gotten bone marrow injury that have led to pre-leukemic changes of leukemia, but that's very, very rare. And rare people have had um, other kinds of toxicities that can be serious, but serious toxicities, again, are uncommon. If you look at a tumor in the liver, and this is after four treatments, you'll see at the end that tumor is just a little teeny weeny thing. If you look at another tumor in the liver, this, this is the time when the treatment was given. This is how it grew before the treatment started. Started like this, a few months later, like this. And then look what happens after you treat. Smaller, 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 till you can hardly see it. Again, here's another one. A tumor. It got bigger. Treatment started. Smaller, 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 gone. I mean, it just has an amazing ability to control these cancers 
and uh, uh, quite lasting control. Some people, it's dramatic. Here's somebody who has so much cancer in the liver this, on a slice of a CAT scan that it looks like this poor uh, individual is almost ready to die of cancer. Was treated with this approach, and this is what happened. Almost all the tumors went away. So it's, um, this is a gastronoma patient. This is an octreotide scan. Lots of tumors, less, 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 and they just um, gradually melt away over a long period of time. One thing that was discovered is the stronger the octreotide scan um, is positive, the greater the chance of the drug working, which makes sense because the drug has to bind to the cancer with somatostatin receptors. So if you have a lot of binding on octreotide scan, it's good. So somebody who has an octreotide scan where the uptake in the tumor is the same as the uptake in the liver, it's not as good as when the uptake in the tumor is way more than the liver and you see strongly positive octreotide scan. So this has been done on literally you know, thousands of patients, mostly in multiple centers in Europe, also being done in England, being done in Canada, Brazil, all over the place, Asia. But in America, it has been uh, just in its infancy that it's been allowed to happen in America. There was one place in Texas uh, which had the American phase one trial and convinced the FDA that this drug is, is quite safe and tolerable. The FDA wanted to have that data from America before going forward. So that study was done and um, accepted by the FDA. And based on that phase one data from Houston, it was then allowed to go forward for a phase three trial. The phase three trial is now starting in the United States. It's an extremely important thing. The FDA has really enormously accelerated the potential approval of this agent by going directly to a phase three trial and skipping phase two trials in America. So it's going to a phase two trial and if this, a phase three trial, and if this trial is positive, the next step would be approval, which is remarkable because you, the FDA is accepting the enormous amount of data from Europe for phase two data, okay? So here is the phase three trial. The other difference between the phase three trial and all previous trials is the phase three trial, the investigational radioactive isotope, lutetium labeled octreotide is being provided for free. So this will not cost patients to participate. All the other trials in Europe and America have been exceedingly expensive in the neighborhood of $60,000, sometimes more. So this is really an enormous difference. The randomized trial, all the medication is provided for free. So who is eligible to go on this important new trial? People that have inoperable, octreotide scan positive, carcinoid tumors of the mid-gut, ones that start in the um, small intestine, appendix, a, a good part of the colon, all of that area are ones that appear to be probably a mid-gut origin can go on this trial. When they mean progressive disease, they mean some progression over a three-year period. So it can be extremely slow progressing and some tumors that, some trials require progression over three months or six months. This requires progression over three years. So really almost anybody would be eligible if the cancer was getting larger. The trial that design that was absolutely insisted upon by the FDA and would not be varied, and is also the identical trial design that's being insisted upon by the regulatory agencies in Europe, is not necessarily the one that I personally would have picked, but it's something that I'm, uh, I, I think is going to, to work out very well and be an excellent um, study. It's a randomized trial between the radioactive high dose radiation that comes from lutetium octreotide versus double dose of normal octreotide. 60 milligrams of octreotide LAR, which is double the dose which is currently FDA approved. The FDA wants to make sure that it's really worth 
the potential toxicity of radioactive octreotide if a double dose of non-radioactive octreotide gives the same thing. It's frustrating when people say, I definitely want this, I know I want it, and you can be randomized to have the non-radioactive octreotide. However, the FDA has also seen what's happened in the past where they've been burned a few times, for example, in bone marrow transplant for breast cancer. A few years back, this was the number one reason why people were receiving bone marrow transplants in America, a very toxic treatment, and it was being used in everybody with advanced breast cancer, it was paid for by Medicaid, Medicare, uh, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, and every insurance company, and it was the number one reason why bone marrow transplant programs existed in most universities. And when a randomized trial was done comparing bone marrow transplant versus no bone marrow transplant, there was absolutely no survival benefit at all. And there are a few things that we could point to in oncology where something that just seems like it should be the definite answer is not the definite answer. And that's why the FDA has not yet approved this treatment and is only allowing it to go forward on clinical trial. Hopefully the trial will be concluded soon and will be good. I'll wrap up soon. Okay, so this is the trial design. And it's, the doses are identical to the doses being given in the European studies. And um, I could tell you that after years of um, working on getting this set up, going through all the uh, nuclear medicine uh, safety requirements and working out every little detail of trial, we finally have everything in place at Cedar sinai and we'll actually be able to start the trial in two weeks. We have a, a formal startup day on April 23rd and Cedars will be you know, the, the center where this will be possible right now in the Western United States. At some point, it uh, may be available at Stanford University as well. Right now, I think that we'll be the only site in the Western United States to uh, have this treatment available. So I'm happy to answer questions, but I think in the interest of time, we'll stop right here. Thank you so much.